Hi, um, I'm Laura Rosenthal. I'm the mayor of Malibu. And I'm also on the um, committee that works with our local library to bring you this speaker series. How many people have come to a speaker series event before? Okay, and it's nice to see a lot of, of newbies here too. So this is our second speaker series of 2016. And it's a, a program of the Malibu Library in the city of Malibu. And we feature experts and authors over a wide range of subjects. And this year, we're trying to focus on some more controversial topics and how they might relate to our community. Um, the abduction of Elizabeth Smart was one of the most followed child abduction cases of our time. Through the traumatic experiences Elizabeth faced as a young child, she's become an advocate for change related to child abduction, recovery programs, and national legislation. She courageously testified against her captor in court about the very, very private nightmare she suffered during her abduction, and she secured a conviction. She launched the Elizabeth Smart Foundation. She promotes the National Amber Alert and the Adam Walsh Child Protection and Safety Act and other legislation to help prevent abductions. She chronicled her experiences in the bestseller, My Story, the book that is for sale and she will be signing. And she also, with other abduction survivors, worked with the Department of Justice to create You're Not Alone, The Journey from Abduction to Empowerment, which is a survivor's guide. So Elizabeth's story is really one of hope, survival, and recovery, and it continues to be so even now. And she shared her message on uh, TED Talks, NPR, CNN, maybe you've heard some of those in the past. So I just am so excited to introduce her, and I know that you will all enjoy hearing her story. Please welcome Elizabeth Smart. It's such a pleasure to be here with you tonight. Uh, thank you for having me. It gave me the perfect excuse to come out and visit my grandma who lives in Palm Springs in the winter. And I, w I was so excited when I got this invitation to come and speak to her. I was like, oh, this is just perfect. We'll just take a, a week off and get out of that freezing cold snow, because I'm from Utah. It's very cold right now, and it'll just be so nice to come to the land of sunshine. <laughs> well, it's raining outside, but, um, and I, I remember I looked on the, I did the map, the time thing, to see how long the drive was. It was said it was only like two hours from Palm Springs to here. I was like, oh, that's fine. My grandma was like, Elizabeth, you better leave a little bit early. You just never know with traffic. I left at 2.30 and I just barely pulled up. <laughs> so, you must all be saints for living here because I don't know how I could handle that traffic every day. But it really is a privilege to be here. So thank you so much for having me. As I have had so many opportunities to travel around the country and meet so many people and work with so many different people. There's one thing that I have found that all of us have in common no matter what. We all have problems. We all have trials, we all have those moments in life where you just kind of step back and you think, wait a second, how did I get here? How did this happen to me? What did I ever do to deserve this? <clears throat> we all have those moments. I mean, hap anyways, yes, they happen. And <laughs> sometimes I know it is so easy to get caught up in them and just, that's all that we're, well, I know for me, sometimes that's all I'm able to see. For instance, at home right now, we're trying to remodel our kitchen. Wow. You know, here we picked out the color of the floor we wanted to, to restain. We, we picked out the cabinets. We picked out everything. The cabinet guy, the morning he was coming to do them, slipped, fell on his hand, broke his hand. The guy came and did the floor. It was like almost as light as this. We were going for like a walnut color, didn't happen. And then I was backing out of the garage, which I've backed out of our garage probably a million times. 
And I ran into the garage door. <laughs> and in those moments, it's so easy for me just to say, how could this happen? This happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. And it's hard to see all the good things that happen in life as well. I mean, thank goodness I have a garage door to run into or back into, not really run into. But thank goodness for that. And I found that for me, I mean, I've had so many people to thank in my life and, and so many, just so many experiences that have meant so much to me to help me get to where I am today. But I've always found that when I step back away from these moments of frustration, that I'm able to always find something good. And I always have a reason to be grateful for something. And that's truly what's helped bring me to where I am today. When I was 14 years old, I was pretty, I mean, pretty just normal, boring. I don't know. I remember being in junior high, which was like the worst experience. So awkward. They just, I just could not wait to be done with junior high. There was nothing good about, well, no, I'm sure there were if I went back and really thought about it. But in my memory, which is selective, um, I don't really remember a whole lot of good things happening. It's just the most awkward time in life. And the one good thing that was going to happen, though, was that I was almost done. I was about to graduate, and I was so excited to go to high school. I know this sounds so silly, but in my 14-year-old mind, high school sounded like the pinnacle of life. I mean, once you made it to high school, you had really arrived. Crazy, I know. But that's just what I thought. And I couldn't wait for that. And I remember it was the night before I was going to graduate from junior high. And I, I just couldn't, I couldn't wait for them to call out my name, pick up my little graduation diploma from junior high, and, and leave that place behind me forever. And I remember going to bed that night. And I come from I come up from a pretty large family. I'm the second of six children. I have one older brother, three younger brothers, and I have a younger sister as well. And my sister and I, because we're the only girls, we shared a room our entire life, it felt like. And so I remember going into the room we shared, and I remember crawling into bed next to her and falling asleep. Well, the next voice that I heard, I did not recognize at all. And I actually thought it just had to be part of my dream. It just had to be part of my imagination. It couldn't really be real. And then the voice spoke again, repeating the same words. I have a knife at your neck. Don't make a sound. Get up and come with me. And as I lay there in bed, I could feel the knife lying across my neck. And I could feel someone's hand on my arm trying to pull me out of bed. And I realized that this wasn't a dream, that there really was a stranger in my bedroom holding a knife at my neck and telling me to get up and go with him. Nothing had ever prepared me for that moment. I mean, I felt like, I mean, I came from a, a wonderful family. I came from a safe neighborhood. I felt like my teachers in school, you know, they told us to be safe. Stop, drop, and roll if you catch on fire. Go under your desk if there's an earthquake. Don't talk to strangers. Look both ways when you cross the street. I mean, I thought I had the general basic safety principles down pretty well. But nothing, nothing ever prepared me for this moment. I immediately got up and went with him. I didn't know what he'd done in my house before he came into my room to get me. I didn't know if he'd gone and killed my parents or my brothers. The one thing I did know, however, was that my younger sister was asleep in bed next to me. And she was still alive. And so maybe if I went with him, he would leave her. He wouldn't hurt her. So I did as he said. And I remember he led me out through my the back door, up through my backyard, our backyard wasn't fenced. Um, I mean, we all thought we lived in a safe neighborhood. We knew all of our neighbors. We none of us could ever dream that something like this would happen. And I, my neighborhood, is up on one of the mountain sides, and we're quite near the top of the neighborhood. Um, so there's only one more street of houses behind my house, and then it's just mountain after that. So it's 
really not hard to get up into the mountains at all from my house. And this man, he took me up through my backyard. We were about to cross this last street when all of a sudden he pushed me down behind a bush. And at this point, I'm, I started thinking, well, he must be planning to have a getaway car come and pick us up because he'd stopped right in front of the street, well, behind some bushes. But we were at the street and I thought, this must be where, where he's, he's planned. And I remember he was holding me down behind these bushes, but I was just able to lift my head up high enough to see some headlights coming down the street. And I thought for sh definitely, for sure, that this was the getaway car. And this car was going so slow, but it kept on coming, kept on coming. Pretty soon passed right in front of us and kept on going. And I'll never forget, as it passed right in front of us, reading the word police written alongside of the car. I know, unbelievable. <laughs> But in that moment, in that split second, it was right in front of us. I thought, oh, they know, they know, they're here, they're going to save me, it's going to be okay. But as soon as that car had gone around the bend, this man was up, pulling me up off the ground and having me run as fast as I could into the mountains on the other side. When we started up into the mountains, initially we were on a trail, but eventually we turned off the trail and just continued up into this, well, it was a ravine of the mountain. And we got to a point where it was so steep and so overgrown with um, bushes and, and trees that you couldn't stand and walk through it. You had to get down on your hands and knees and crawl through it. And I remember it just felt like hours and hours and hours. We kept going and going and going. And finally, right as the sun was coming up, we crossed over the top of the mountain and we started down the other side. And when we got to about a quarter of the way down the other side, we came to a grove of trees. Well, we'd been fighting our way through clumps and groves of trees the whole way up. I mean, what was so special about this growth of trees? I, and from the outside, you couldn't see anything. I mean, it looked just the same as everything else. But I remember he directed me to walk down into it, and so I did. And... Once you got inside this grove of trees, I saw how part of the mountainside had been leveled out. And there was a tent set up. And outside of the tent, there were tarps lying on the ground and tarps hanging up in the trees. And there was this woman who walked out of the tent. And she came up to, to us. And the first thing she did was immediately take me into her arms and start hugging me. Well, you think maybe that would be nice, like it's okay, it's gonna be okay kind of hug, but if hugs could speak, I mean, if they could communicate, this was not that kind of hug at all. This was, a, this was like a nonverbal threat, if anything. It was, it was like she was trying to tell me that if I ever tried to come against her, if I ever uh, did anything she didn't want me to do, I would be sorry for it, that she would win every time. And she immediately brought me inside of the tent, and it was just the two of us. She sat me down on this upturned bucket inside the tent. She zipped the door up. She didn't say anything. It was just quiet. Not that I was in the mood to talk anyways. I, I just couldn't believe that this was happening to me. I'd never been so scared or so worried in my entire life. And I remember she started taking off my shoes. She started um, washing my feet. And then she started to try to undress me. Well... As a 14-year-old girl, I was incredibly shy. I mean, sort of a funny little story to help you get to know me a little bit better at that age. I come from a very, very large, large family. My mom was eight of nine kids. And on my mom's side, just my mom's side, I have over 50 cousins. And they have kids now. I don't even know how many, like 150 I don't know. There's just tons. I've got a ton of family is what I'm saying. And family, they're wonderful. They're the people that you can turn to no matter what. And they're basically obligated to love you. And they're the people that you should feel most comfortable around and most safe around. And, and it doesn't matter if you make a mistake or make an idiot of yourself. They'll still love you. Well, as it happens, I fall on the young end of this large spectrum of cousins. And because I grew up playing the harp, I 
always got volunteered to play the background music at all the wedding receptions. So one of my older cousins was getting married. I was playing the background music. It was lovely, blah, 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 you know, nice flowers, nice cake, nice dress, whatever. Anyways, uh, my attention span started to disappear and I decided to sort of break up the plane, break up the night. I would go to the restroom and then maybe the dessert table, I don't know, and then eventually go back and keep playing. Well, I got up and I went to the restroom and, and I walked out and I'm heading towards that dessert table when all of a sudden I noticed some people laughing. And at first I just thought I'd missed something, didn't think anything of it, maybe it was just their own conversation. But I kept on walking and some more people started laughing and pretty soon I started to wonder, well, what on earth is going on? What did I miss? And all of a sudden, my mom came running up to me and she said, Elizabeth, dear, you've tucked the back of your dress into your underwear. You might want to sort that out. Well, I was mortified. I ran into the bathroom and hid in the stall the rest of the evening. And finally, at the end of the evening, my mom came in and she said, Elizabeth, come on, you need to come out. You know, we've already packed up the harp. We're all waiting for you. Let's go home. And I just remember crying to my mom saying, I can't. I'm so embarrassed. My mom, she said, come on. It's not that big of a deal. It was a simple mistake. You know, all, think of it. All the, all the people that are here, at least, at the very least, half of them are women. Probably more because, well, weddings, women, you know. So all those women that were there, they understand completely what you're going through between underwear and nylons and slips and puffy dresses. That is just a lot of layers to maneuver. It's, it's okay, they understand. And the other half, they're just boys, who cares? That just did not make me feel any better. And she kept saying, you know what, the world will continue to move on, and as long as you had on clean underwear, you'll be fine. <laughs> I did, but that didn't make me feel any better. <clears throat> so, <laughs> I remember finally getting into the car and telling my parents that I never wanted to see any of the family ever again because I was so embarrassed. The people that I should be least embarrassed around. And having that number of family, having that large of a family, it is a really difficult task. I mean, you have to like consciously try to avoid people when you're related to that many people. I think I made it a week, and probably to this day, that's probably a record. Anyways, back to this mountainside. I mean, that's just who I was, so easily embarrassed, so shy. And so having a complete stranger try to undress me and sponge bathe me, I'm sure you can imagine how I would have felt. I mean, that was just the last thing in the world that I would have been okay with. And I remember grabbing hold of the buttons on my pajamas and clamping my elbows down next to my torso so that she couldn't take them off. And she did not like that at all. And she told me that if I didn't let her do this, she would have Emmanuel, which, by the way, was the name of the man as I knew him at that point in time. Um, she told me he would come in and he would rip my pajamas off me. So if I didn't want that, then I needed to let her undress me. Wow. <sighs> Times how I already felt by, I don't know, infinity. And that would be about how I felt about him coming in there, or really coming anywhere near me. So I, I begged with her and I pled with her, telling her I'd showered last night, I wasn't dirty, just give me what you want me to put on, I'll put it on, just don't touch me, I can do it myself. She finally gave in, which at that point in time, I did not realize what a big deal that was. But she finally just passed me this long robe, just like a robe she had on, and told me to put it on. So I did, and she had me take off all my clothes uh, underneath. And then she picked up all my clothing, and she got up and she walked out of the tent. Well, I started looking around this tent and wondering, why was this happening to me? What was gonna happen next? Why would they make me wear this strange robe? 
And I remember as I was looking around, I remember seeing um, those foamy camping pads that you sleep on in the tent. And I remember seeing sheets and blankets and pillows. And I remember having this thought that these people had been here for quite some time already. I mean, that this was a really well thought out camp, a, a very well prepared camp. And in the meantime, the tent door unzips and in walks this man. And he changed out of the dark clothes that he'd initially kidnapped me in into a robe, just like the one I had on, just like the one the woman had on. And he knelt down next to me and he started to speak to me. Well, to be truthful with you, I really, really couldn't even begin to pay attention to what he was saying because I had just been kidnapped. I had just been taken out of my bed. I had, I mean, taken out of my home. My world, I felt like, had just been snatched away from me. And so I wasn't paying attention to what he was saying, but finally something inside me said, you probably should listen. You should probably see what he's saying uh, so that you know what's going on, so that you can, I don't know, find a way to get home or escape or talk to these people and, and help them realize what they've done. Because on the way up, the couple of times that we spoke, I begged and pled with him to let me go. And... He'd always say, I know exactly what I'm doing. I'm not going to get caught. I know what the consequences are. And I'm still going to do this. So, I mean, that hadn't worked. So I felt like I should listen to what he said. And I only heard the last sentence that he said, which probably was the worst sentence that he said. And I don't, I will never forget it. He said, I hereby seal you to me as my wife before God and his angels as my witnesses. Well, wow, <laughs> out of everything I expected to hear, that was so far beyond. That was just completely out of my range of what, of anything. And I remember just screaming out, no, because how could that be okay? How could he think he could do that? I mean, I was 14 years old and looking at me, I probably looked like I was 10. I mean, I didn't look old. It was not hard to tell I was a little girl. How could he do that? And, and when I screamed out, no, he looked at me and he said, if you ever scream out like that again, I will kill you. And I remember telling him I, I wouldn't scream out again, but he had to see why this wasn't okay. He had to understand this. I mean, all of the reasons that I'm sure everyone can think of were all the reasons I tried to explain to him why this wasn't okay. And... Every time I came up with an excuse, he'd come back with the same retort, which was, in God's eyes, we're married, and it's time for us to consummate our marriage. Well, as I mentioned, I not only looked young, but I was young. I mean, I grew up in a very sheltered environment, a very protected um household, you could say. I mean, my parents were very strict with all of us and very protective of all of us. And at that point in my life, I'd never heard that word before. And I remember thinking, what on earth does he mean? And I had this thought come to my mind of what it could possibly mean. And I remember thinking, no, there's no way one human being could do that to another human being. There's just no way at all. And I remember just begging and pleading with him still, but nothing I said or did made a difference. And he finally just forced me onto the ground where he raped me. And when he was finished, he got up, turned around and, and left. And I'll never forget how I felt lying there. I felt so filthy and so broken and so completely shattered. I just felt that what would ever be the point of being rescued? because no one could ever want to have anything to do with me now. No one could ever want any part of me now because I was so broken. I was so dirty. And I remember just lying there and thinking about 
stories that I'd seen on the news of other children who had been kidnapped and raped, but their stories always ended that they were immediately killed afterwards. And I remember sitting there, well, lying there, thinking they were the lucky ones because they would never have to live another moment longer feeling this pain and this embarrassment and this shame and just feeling so terrible inside. They were lucky. And I ended up falling asleep thinking those thoughts. And when I woke up, there was this man, and he was kneeling over me again. But this time, he had a thin piece of metal cable, and he was wrapping it around my ankle. And then he was crushing bolts into place so that I couldn't run away. And honestly, if I could have sunk any lower in that moment, I did. I mean, if there was anything lower than rock bottom, I hit it. <clears throat> I remember standing up to see what I was connected to, and it was, I, it was connected to a tree, and it was just far enough for me to be able to lie down inside the tent, and just far enough for me to reach the bucket that was used as a toilet. And that was as far as I could reach, maybe 12, 15 feet at the most, and that's probably being more than general. No, I'd say it was between 10 and 12, really, but we'll say between 12 and 15. Anyways, that doesn't matter. Sorry, I get so sidetracked sometimes. Um, <clears throat> I remember looking at this cable and just wondering how long would I live for? This camp was so well hidden. It was so well stocked. I was chained up. Clearly, they didn't want me to run away. Clearly, they didn't want anybody to find us. How long would I be with them? Would it be a year? Would it be a few weeks? Would it be... Many years? What if it was so long that I forgot who I was, that I forgot my name because they had immediately told me I was no longer Elizabeth and they immediately told me I could no longer talk about my family or my life before. They basically told me that my life began the moment he kidnapped me and they said that from that moment forward was really the only thing I could talk about. And what if I forgot who I really was? And that thought really, really scared me. So I started to think of everyone and everything that was important to me. And at the very top of that list, my mom. She came to my mind. She was the one person who more than anything, I didn't want to forget. I didn't want to forget anything about her. The way she looked, the way she sounded, the way she smelled, the way that I, I felt when she'd hold me, just so safe, just like no one could ever hurt me. And <clears throat> I started to think of all of the things that she used to say to me, all of the things she used to tell me to do, things I'm sure many of you have told or do tell your children, or maybe you are being told on a daily basis, like, have you done your homework yet? Have you done your chores yet? How about your practicing? Okay, be home by 5.30 for dinner, blah, 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 blah. And as I sat there, trying to just absolutely engrave each of these memories on my brain. I had one very specific memory come to mind. One day I'd come home from school and I was very upset. And my mom had asked me why I was so upset. And I told her that I'd been sitting at lunch at, uh, with a group of my friends and the most popular girl in the school came over to our table. And she said, oh, this weekend, we're having a party at my house, and you're all invited. Well, except you. You're not invited. <laughs> well, I felt crushed. I mean, why did she not want me there? Fair enough. I mean, we weren't friends. Maybe it was a stretch to call us acquaintances. But all the same, why would she not want me there? I just, I couldn't understand it. I mean, she, there were other girls that she knew as little as, as me that were sitting at the table. I mean, why, why didn't she single one of them out or, or at least pick on a couple of us? <clears throat> and I just felt so bad about that. And my mom, she, she came back to me and she said, Elizabeth, you know, <sighs> these girls that you were sitting at a table with, are, are they your true friends? Wouldn't a true friend say, come on, Elizabeth, I'll hang out with you, or we'll have our own party, or we'll go to the movies, or I don't know, eat half a gallon of ice cream together. Isn't that what a true friend would say? And besides, is it really going to be so terrible spending a weekend at home with me? And you know what? <clears throat> on, on second thought, <sighs> popular, 
Well, it really is just another word for rude. So just don't think about it. You're fine. Don't let them make your happiness. You make your own happiness. Well, none of those things made me all that happy, to tell you the truth. I mean, it said I had bad friends, I had a non-existent social life, and, well, every other girl in the junior high aspired to be rude. Not exactly happy thoughts. <laughs> she went on and she said, you will meet so many people in your lifetime, and... People will make their opinions, and sometimes you won't always understand them. I mean, sometimes you'll wonder, you know, why does this person not like me? And sometimes you'll wonder, oh, why does this person like me? But you know, of all these opinions that are made, of all these people that you meet, there's really only going to be a few that are truly important. Now, the first person that's the most important is God, and he loves you. And he'll never turn his back on you. Only you can turn your back on him. <clears throat> the second person who is most important, well, that would be me. And I love you. And I always will. Nothing can ever change that. No matter where you go or what you do, you'll always be my daughter and I'll always want what's best for you. And always remember that. And as I sat on this mountainside, I remembered it, and I realized that she was right. I realized that it didn't matter. All of these things that had happened to me, as terrible as they were, it wouldn't make a difference to her. She would still love me. I would still be her daughter. She would still want the best for me. And when I made that realization, I realized that, yes, my dad would still love me. Yes, my siblings, well, they didn't really have a choice. But we would still be a family, and even if I died and never saw them again, they would still be my family, and they would still love me. And when I realized that, I knew that I had something worth surviving for. It made all the difference in that world, that one realization, because that helped me make the decision that no matter what happened to me, no matter what lay in front of me, I would do whatever I had to if it meant that I would survive, if it meant that I had a chance of one day going back home and living with my family again, even if that meant doing whatever it took with these two people, these two monsters for the next 30 years, waiting until they died. <clears throat> if that's what it took, in my mind I was preparing myself for that because my family was worth it. Thank goodness it didn't take 30 years. <laughs> I, don't, I hope I would have made it, but you never know. <laughs> Maybe I would have broken, I'm not sure. Um, but that decision saw me through so much, and it <laughs> saw me through nine months of so much, really. And I'll never forget the day that I was rescued. Nine months later, well, during that time, we'd ended up going to California, um, actually, not too far from here, a um, little bit more south, but uh, we had decided, well, not we, really, not me. I had no say in anything, but my captors had decided to return to Utah, and we hitchhiked the whole way back, which, oh my goodness, do not recommend to anyone, but we made it. It was a good idea at the time. I thought maybe someone would recognize me or know something was off and maybe call the police or something. It was a good idea. <clears throat> but we finally made it, thank goodness. And we were walking up State Street in Salt Lake City, which is a pretty big street. It's very busy, um, very, very big, very big. That's really all I can say about it. And all of a sudden, there were police cars pulling up around us and these police officers were jumping out of the car. And this was not the first time that we'd been approached by police officers. And my captors, well, firstly, I should probably say this is probably one of the most commonly asked questions I get is, you know, why didn't you say something if you were approached by officers? Why didn't you say something? Why didn't you scream or run or do something? And I think it's very important, actually, that I answer this question <clears throat> because I, it's true for me, but I know it's true for so many other victims and survivors out there. I didn't run 
and other survivors and victims don't run, not because we don't want to, because trust me, we want to more than anything in the world, but we've been so threatened and so abused for such a long time that these people who've hurt us, who control us, who've manipulated us, it's like they become invincible. Because I watched my two captors lie to people. I watched them steal, I watched them cheat. I mean, he kidnapped me out of my own home. He raped me, he chained me up. Nobody ever stopped him. Nobody ever stepped in and said, this isn't okay, you can't do that. I mean, no one had ever come to my aid. So when he said, if I ever said anything or did anything he didn't want me to do, he would kill me. I believed him because everything else he said, everything else he did, I mean, always went the way he said it would. So when he said, you know, say what I tell you to say, don't speak to the officers. And if you have to, you know, you t tell them this, tell them you're our daughter, tell them, you know, we're, we're street ministers and, and all this other stuff. So that's why I didn't immediately run and why I didn't immediately answer. Not because I didn't want to, just because I'd been so threatened for so long. And for me, I had every reason to believe this man and, and his wife that they do everything they said to me. And what if I did say who I was <clears throat> and they didn't believe me and they, they, they let us go? What would my captor do to me then? He, he probably would have killed me, I don't know. So that's why it was really self-preservation. So when, that, when the officers started talking to us, I didn't answer immediately. And finally, one of the officers noticed how uncomfortable I was. And so he said, well, let's just, let's just separate them. Let's just question her alone for a minute. So they took me just a few yards off and they started talking to me. And at first I kept giving them the answers that I'd been told just because I was so scared. And up until this point, you maybe could say that I did not have a whole lot of faith in other people because no one had helped me up until this point. But finally, the officer looked at me and said, you know, there's a girl and she's been gone for a very long time now and her parents miss her so much and they've never stopped looking for their, they've never given up hope on her, they've never stopped loving her, they want her to come home. Don't you want to go home now? And it was only then in that moment that I finally found the courage to admit who I was. And then he handcuffed me and put me in the back of the police car. That didn't instill much confidence either. But <clears throat> we did make it back to the police station. I was eventually unhandcuffed. And I was brought to this little tiny room and it didn't have any windows. It just it was like the size of a closet. It had one little sofa in there and they left me alone in there. I didn't know what was gonna happen. In my mind I started thinking, oh my word, they are gonna send me to prison. They think I'm guilty. They didn't even let me call my parents. Isn't that one of my rights? Don't I get a phone call? If they thought I was innocent, wouldn't they have taken me home or picked up my parents on the way or let me talk to them or something? They did handcuff me. They must really think I'm guilty. <laughs> I'm going to prison. <laughs> Shoot. <clears throat> well, prison. Let's think. You have a ceiling and um, you've got a bed, your own bed. It's not like you have to share a bed with anyone. And you've got food guaranteed every single day. And maybe you don't get a shower every day, but you probably get a shower a few times a week, which is more than what I've experienced in the last nine months, maybe once. I don't know, but I did stink pretty bad. <clears throat> and I, as I sat there thinking about all these things, all these luxuries that were available in prison, I started to think, oh, right, well, prison doesn't sound all that bad, actually. You know what? No matter what happens from here on out, things can only go up. I mean, things really can't get any worse than where I've been. And right as, right as I made that realization, right as I kind of came to that conclusion, the door just flew open 
and my dad came running into the room. He just looked at me for a second, and then he came over and he picked me up in the biggest hug you can imagine. And he just started crying. So of course when he cries, I start crying. But <clears throat> he said, Elizabeth, is it really you? And I think I went into shock for a minute because <sighs> everything had just happened so fast without any forewarning. It took me, once again, a minute to respond. Either that or I'm just a little bit slow. It could be that one as well. <clears throat> Anyways, I did eventually respond to him. And I just remember as he sat there holding me, it was the happiest moment of my life. And I just knew that whatever lay in front of me, whatever, whatever might happen, it was going to be okay because no matter what, my dad was going to be there and he was never going to let anyone hurt me ever again the way that these two people had hurt me the last nine months. I knew it was going to be okay. And I remember we were then transported up to um, the Salt Lake headquarter, headquarters where my mom and my siblings were waiting. And I remember seeing my mom again. And I know People Magazine, they come out every, it seems like, I don't know, it seems like every couple of months with who they think the world's most beautiful woman is and you name it. They've all been on the front, Angelina Jolie, Julia Roberts, blah, 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 whoever. And every time I see this cover, I think, nope, sure, they're lovely. I'm not saying they're not, but um, they're wrong because the most beautiful woman in the world is my mom. I mean, she looked just like an angel when I saw her again that first time. And I remember we eventually all made it home and I just, I felt like a princess. I was back in my, my home, my house, and there was carpet and, and showers. You know, I, I had a shower and a bath. I could take a shower or a bath. I didn't, you know, I didn't have to like wait for a bucket of water to be poured over me. And there was a pantry and a refrigerator. <sighs> I was no longer eating like leftovers taken out of the garbage. I mean, wow, I felt just like royalty. I felt so blessed and so lucky. And I remember the following morning, my mom gave me the best piece of advice I've ever been given, and, and I want to share it with you. And I'm not perfect at following it because <sighs> what daughter is, but I do try. And it's helped me get to where I am today. And she said to me, Elizabeth, what these people have done to you is terrible. There aren't words strong to describe how wicked and evil they are. They have stolen nine months of your life away from you that you will never get back. The best punishment you could ever give them is to be happy, is to move forward with your life because no matter what happens to them, you may never feel like restitution has been made. You may never feel like justice is served, but you don't need to worry about that because at the end of the day, God is our ultimate judge, and trust me, they will get their just reward in the end. And everything that's been taken away from you, every hurt, every pain that you've gone through will be made up to you, and you don't need to worry about it. So just don't, don't even think about them. Just move forward with your life, and you just be happy, and you do exactly what you want to do. And... I've always tried to follow that advice. I think, I think it's great for all of us because like I was saying at the beginning, we all have our struggles. We all have our trials. We all have those times when we fall down in the mud and we want to sit there and cry and say, why me? Why did this have to happen? And that's okay. That's okay to take a minute. That's okay to have a moment in the mud. We all need that sometimes. But at the end of the day, or at the end of that moment, or that period of time, a time does come where we have to realize that we can't, we can't wait for other people to make us happy. We need to find our own happiness. We need to make that happiness ourselves. We can't allow people to, to destroy us or to make us, people always can make us feel bad. But what I'm trying to say is we can't allow other people to make our own happiness for us and to destroy our lives. I have 
met so many incredible people who have gone through so much and they inspire me every single day to keep going. And I don't think that there ever comes a point in life when you're like, that's it, that's me. Now I'm, I've got it made. It's just smooth sailing from here on out. I think life is, you know, as soon as we climb one mountain, there's another. And we take it one day at a time and we get a little bit stronger every day. And I think life is a journey. Life is a, well, really, life is a healing process from life, I'd say, because I certainly hope that every day I get better and stronger and happier. And I certainly hope that I think of where I've been and where I am today and just what a big difference that's been. But I think, you know, what will the next five or 10 years or maybe just the next year bring me? And I certainly hope that I'm better than happier, stronger than I am today. And so with that being said, um, I just want to end and we'll open up for question and answer by saying thank you so much for listening to me tonight and giving me the opportunity to share my story and speak to you. And thank you so much for just being who you are and doing all the wonderful things that everyone does because it's not Batman or Superman or Iron Man who, who make all the difference in the world. It's, it's you. It's everyday people who in their own ways are trying to make a difference. So with that being said, once again, thank you. And if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them.